USA Ultimate is proud to present the 2013 USA Ultimate National Championship. Full moon here in Frisco, Texas, and a lot on the line between Denver, Johnny Bravo, and San Francisco Revolver. The winner of this game will move on to the championship round tomorrow here at Frisco ISD Memorial Stadium. Semifinal number one is in the book. Seattle Sockeye with a double game point win over Boston Ironside. So it's the number one seed versus the number four seed here in the second semifinal matchup. We welcome you down to Frisco, Texas. Mike Cousins and former Wake Forest Ultimate Captain Evan Lepler. And so for these two teams, it's a big trip. Number one versus number four. This may be the best game of semifinal Saturday. And Revolver is the ultimate institution right now. Been in the title game each of the last three years with two championships. Of course, Double Wide knocked him off last year. And then you have this Johnny Bravo team from Denver. A bunch of up-and-coming athletes and some former Revolver players as well that will try to knock San Francisco off its pedestal. Johnny Bravo out of Colorado, not necessarily your powerhouse area when you think about a San Francisco or a Seattle. Under head coach Bob Cryer last year, the uh, USA Ultimate US Open champion. And so they're going to come in with Bart Watson, a former Revolver player, and he's our guy to watch. Well, he's one of the great players in the sport of Ultimate in the last decade. Just a true all-around threat who's been a, a mainstay on Revolver and now is playing for Johnny Bravo. And the bearded Bart Watson, a guy who will fire up his teammates on every big play he makes, and there will be a bunch of them, but he's complimented by a bunch of younger athletes as well who will be difference makers for Johnny Bravo. And then there's Revolver, led by none other than the the enigma, the dynamic athlete, Bo Kittredge, a guy who absolutely is the best athlete in the sport. If you've never seen him on YouTube, you had a great chance here at the end of the U.S. Open. His sky was a contested play that finished things off as Kittredge showed his great athleticism to help Revolver to a tournament championship. And like Bart Watson playing his old team, Bo Kittredge used to play for Johnny Bravo. He went to college at Colorado. That was his catch in the final play of the U.S. Open to bring San Francisco a championship. Both these teams one day away from Championship Sunday in Frisco. The winner takes on Seattle Sockeye, Denver Johnny Bravo, and San Francisco Revolver. First poll is next from Frisco, Texas. Welcome to the USA Ultimate National Championships, the third and final leg of the Triple Crown Tour, Ultimate's highest level of competition. Everyone's invited. The USA Ultimate National Championships are presented by the Discraft Ultrastar 175 Sport Disc, the official championship disc of USA Ultimate since 1991. USA Ultimate, the national governing body for the sport of Ultimate in the United States. To find out more about the sport of Ultimate or where to play in your community, visit www.usaultimate.org. From the Lone Star State, more USA Ultimate National Championship coverage as we get set for Denver and San Francisco. Here is the starting seven for Denver. And one name we're going to hear probably quite often is Jimmy Mickle, number 23. Jimmy Mickle, one of the best players in the college game this past year. He's still an undergrad for the University of Colorado. Mama Bird, Ryan Farrell, and Josh Ackley, two handlers to watch as well. And for Revolver, just a stacked team. Ashland Joy and Bo Kittredge, both members of the USA World Games team. Nick Schlag, one of their senior, uh, one of their captains. He's a primary handler on the offensive line for head coach Mike Payne and Revolver. Looking forward to this matchup. If you're unfamiliar with Ultimate new to the sport, it's seven on seven, game to 15 with a few stipulations, and we'll bring those in as the game goes along. Halftime is first to eight. Players can't run with the disc, a travel call similar to basketball, and it's a self-officiated sport. There are observers. You see those in the orange T-shirts if the players defer to them. Otherwise, the majority of calls disputed and solved between both players involved in the action. And unlike really any other sport televised today, we have the observers mic'd up down in the field, and we will hear the disputes settled live in front of us. The real thing. There's Jimmy Mickle, number 23, with a long hair and now 
Revolver will pull to get us started. Revolver in the white. And Tim Gilligan, the first pull for San Francisco. So we're underway in semifinal number two. Seattle's Sockeye has already advanced to tomorrow's final five Eastern for Central, covered right here on ESPN3 and on the Watch ESPN app. That was Ryan Farrell to Jimmy Mickle, and Bart Watson just keeps the feet inbounds. Those are three dynamic players. Farrell teammates with Bo Kittrich, Ashlyn Joy, and also Mac Taylor for the U.S. World Games team. Interesting to see who matches up with Farrell. Looks like Revolver has Sam Canner, one of the leaders of the defensive line, marking Farrell at the outset. Looking deep for Mickle. Backhand pull to the end zone. Mickle in traffic, and it's deed away. Three Revolver defenders in the area deny Mickle the first score. Well, Jimmy Mickle does not make this catch, but I am consistently amazed at how Mickle, who's a powerful but built player, still elevates like a little guy. I mean, he gets up as good as anybody in the game. And he will probably tell you he should have come down with that one. Mac Taylor had his hand in on the D. Now two on one, back the other way, layout bid. That's a catch for Revolver. Great snare by Lucas Dahlman to keep the possession alive for San Francisco. Dahlman, a great addition to the San Francisco team this year, a defensive stalwart. His first year with the squad. One of just a few first-year players on Revolver. A team that was born right. in the San no Francisco scene. They come back to zero if it stays. Created it's in 2006. Mike Payne, one of the key founders of Revolver, a team that tried to put role players ahead of superstars and trying to make superstars out of young role players. And you know, I chatted with Mike Payne early in the day on Friday, and he said the thing he was most pleased about on Thursday was sure how well his young players competed and really made things happen for Revolver. And that's one of the most interesting things about the Revolver philosophy. They have some of the best players in the game, although they give it away here, and it's Bravo on the move. That was a great poach by Bart Watson. And he's got an idea of what Revolver wants to do, that's for sure, looking deep. Well, so far, both teams coming out early, trying to go deep. Josh Ackley, the intended recipient of the huck from Watson. Ackley, a great player in college for Mama Bird as well. His nickname, Richter. A thunderous deep threat. Mickle there on the D, and he knocks it away with his left hand, going step for step with Lucas Dolman. Mickle had position. And the question is, let, let him get that. is there a call? <laughs> Nickel made Lucas Dahlman look like a child right there. And it didn't look like he tried to ward him off with his other hand either. A very solid defensive play from Mickel. Farrell swoops in under fierce man-to-man -man defense early on by San Francisco. A lot of Colorado alums on Johnny Bravo, as you'd expect. A lot of Stanford alums on Revolver. But certainly a mix of all different college alums represented. This is Farrell, who played college ultimate at William & Mary. Williamsburg, Virginia. Top 
teams in the country will rely on some college players to fill out rosters. It's very rare to find a college player who's a star, but Ryan Farrell told me, look, Jimmy Mickle is already a star in the club ultimate circuit. Thursday and Friday over at the FC Dallas Soccer Complex, it's not possible to go around and watch every game. You catch a few points here and a few points there, going around to take in as much ultimate as you can, but any time there was a Johnny Bravo game going on, you heard Jimmy Mickle's name mentioned with the Denver team every single time. Pass a little high, and this has been a sloppy first point. Both teams have had chances. And Bar Watson's going to burn a timeout. This game's about six minutes old. And Johnny Bravo receiving the first pull, trying to reset the offense here. Three turns for both teams here before this first point gets scored. And at the end of last game, in our post-game interview, we heard this is a very fast turf. And that's probably what these teams are starting to figure out. All but one of the fields on Thursday and Friday were turf fields. So things are going to move a little bit faster for two teams that like to huck here. They've got a chance to play tomorrow in the championship matchup against Seattle Sockeye. And this weekend is a big weekend for the sport of ultimate. Plenty of Hall of Fame members here. It's the first time that it's been held outside of Sarasota, Florida for the first time in 13 years. It has been in Texas before, but a, a long-running event dating back to 1979. Well, the tournament has been impeccably run. The fields over at the FC Dallas Toyota Stadium complex were pristine and really held up great despite some rain on Tuesday, Wednesday, and again on Friday. But there's a change of pace that you need to adjust to when you come to a stadium like this for the semifinals. And this is a, a field turf surface compared to the primarily grass surfaces over in the pool play and pre-quarters and quarterfinals. Another stoppage. On top of that, this is the biggest crowd that any of these teams have played in front of over the course of the entire weekend. And perhaps even larger than they would have played in front of in Sarasota, Florida in each of the last 13 years. It's going to be interesting to see if the crowd gets behind one of these teams more than the other or if they're simply going to root for a tight game. I bet you the crowd wants as many hucks as possible. Now with the elimination of Austin Doublewide, no hometown team, if you will. Austin about three hours away here from Frisco to root for with Colorado and San Francisco being represented. Oh. Ryan Farrell for Bravo was called for a foul. Sam Canner guarding him tightly. Farrell, you know, prides himself on his defense, certainly a, a dynamic all-around player, Chris, but hey, one of the kicks. best Come handler defenders in the game. Put in one. Coming in one. That's it. Chris! Like, I got to be honest, very rarely do you see Revolver not wearing red, so it takes a, a few minutes to get used to Johnny Bravo in the red and Revolver in the white. Mickle on the goal line. Up line, flick to the sideline. And we've got our first score. Josh Ackley with a diving grab, puts Bravo in front, 1-0. Josh Ackley, a fiery source of strength for this team, a nice backhand break to Mickle on the goal line, then the up line cut, a dangerous throw with John Levy trailing, one of the defensive leaders for Revolver, but great job dragging the feet and able to stay in bounds. Bravo able to hold on a long marathon first point. Johnny Bravo trying to build on a, a disappointing National Championship Tournament in 2012. 
The Denver team came into Nationals seeded fifth, went two and six and finished 12th. So that has been festering for a year for Denver. Disappointment in Sarasota last October. Between injuries and the U23 World Games and the main World Games, a lot of Bravo's players were, you know, not in Denver for a good chunk of the summer. There was a time when there was just, you know, 10 to 12 guys, the core group that were in the Denver Boulder area, trying to grind it out and work hard when numbers were down to build chemistry and to build the sort of cohesiveness that you need to be the best. Coming up four, coming up four. Now we get a look at the offensive line for Revolver. Jordan Jeffrey gives it back to Schlag. Ashlyn Joy with his first touch. And, and there's Bo Kittredge. Hooker Snyder gets the most difficult mark of the evening. And a great D. That's Henry Conker, who was a practice player to begin last season for Johnny Bravo. Now he's a starter on the D-line, one of the most improved players in the entire sport over the last 18 months. And a huge mistake. In and out of the hands of Jackson Clor. Back to Revolver. They still got a long field, about 63 yards to go before they get on the board. Wow. This is surprisingly sloppy here from both teams. Bravo looking for the break. And another turnover. Ashlyn Joy intercepts it. So he'll tap it in right on the goal line. Deed up quickly by Eric Johnson. He hawks long, looking for Bo Kittredge, who snags it, and his momentum takes him a few yards short of the goal line as he waits for the rest of his team to catch up. That's the joy of having Bo Kittredge on one's team as he provides an immediate deep threat, and Joel Schlockett finishes off the possession, tied at one. Schlockett, the California alum, hauls it in. After Joy hit Kittredge, the connection of two guys who represented the United States of America this past July and August in Columbia. So it's the Huck reception by Kittredge that sets up that entire score there for Revolver. And he represents such an interesting dynamic on offense because you see him start to break away here and he's hardly at, at full stride when he goes down the field. But what Mike Payne seeks to do with this team, the San Francisco philosophy, is not just to put the bear, the you know, the load on the shoulders of the stars. They're going to diversify and use everybody in the spotlight. Well, that was the, the ethos when Nick Handler, Chris McManus, and Mark Weinberger created Revolver, and they've built basically a juggernaut in the championship game for three straight seasons, including two championships and clearly making it look pretty easy. Sub-Zero from Minneapolis tested Revolver in the quarterfinals, but he never watched that game and thought that Revolver was going to go down. A lot of Carlton's best players, Simon Montague, Julia, Julian Childs Walker, and, and others on that uh, Sub-Zero team that knocked off Goat in its first game of pool play. But, you know, you just always watch Revolver and think they're going to get it done. Pressure defense from San Francisco, forcing Denver home. And now a look deep for Watson. He's got space in the end zone. And a catch and a score. Watson, the former Revolver player, makes it 2-1 Denver. It's funny. Revolver knows all about mental toughness. It's, and it's one of the reasons San Francisco has been so good. And the other reason that San Francisco has been so good is because of great players like Bart Watson, who's now wearing the Johnny Bravo red. And an easy score, surpassing the defender. Tom James. A nice throw, but frankly, a pretty easy throw. As long as you don't throw it out the back here, Bart Watson's going to make the play. And he had plenty of room to spare. And right now, a stark difference from when games started earlier today at noon central. 
there was a lot of wind in that first game. You were down on the field and said there might be some interesting wind tunnels, or I guess we should say tunnels created. But now there's absolutely no wind whatsoever. Yeah, it's very calm and tranquil out there right now. Great for hucking. Ideal conditions for both teams to air it out a little bit. Offsides called on the pull, so you can be offsides once with no ramifications. The observer actively ruled offsides. May have been Taylor Leahy who was off. Zach Travis, another UC Berkeley alum, also spent some time at Harvard where he was coached by Ironside head coach Josh McCarthy. Boston Ironside, a valiant performance in the second half to bring it to double game point, but Seattle Sockeye awaiting the winner of this fourth quarter, uh, fourth semifinal of the day, second men's semi. We'll have a triple header of championship games for you tomorrow here on ESPN3. Revolver hucking again. And Ashlyn Joy is open for the score for San Francisco. We're tied at two. Let the hucking games begin here in this semifinal. And ideal conditions. And both teams are making smart, not reckless decisions. Very simple for Ashlyn Joy. Marcelo Sanchez let it rip. He's another first year player for the San Francisco Revolver team, a senior at UC Davis. You know, he's considered an offensive cutter, but when you have a cutter who can also huck it deep, that's when you become truly dynamic as an offense. And Ashlyn Joy, one of the most solid players on the Revolver roster. Ashland's father, Steve, was a well-known club player. Mike Payne, the head coach of Revolver, remembers playing with Steve Joy, and Ashland was five years old on the sideline, tossing the disc around, serving as the water boy. He's much more than that right now. It's a nice save by Ryan Farrell. Contact in the layout try there from Andrew Hagen. And a foul call. No contest on the foul call. Foul call there basically gives Watson a chance to get up and not have the stall count be at three or four by the time he gains his balance and sets a pivot foot. Watson hucking long. Jimmy Mickle on the run. He brings it in, has action behind him. Right on the doorstep. Mickle patient. And Bravo converts on the play. That's a goal for Denver. Hit a Snyder after the huck to Jimmy Mickle. Snyder. Younger brother of Hilka, currently at Colorado as well. The Mama Bird connection. And Mickle, very patient, creates an isolation in the end zone. And no matter who's defending, that's really tough to stop, even if Mac Taylor, who's a national caliber player, is on the other end. Two assists now for Jimmy Mickle to help make it 3-2 Denver, as this game in the early going at least very reminiscent of semifinal number one between Seattle and Boston as the team's trade scores. Bravo and Revolver met only one time during the regular season. That was a 15-12 win for Revolver at the West Coast Cup in Seattle, but Bravo entered as the four seed, able to take down Chain Lightning and Machine in some tight pool play action. And perhaps the game 
of the tournament in the quarterfinals. Certainly had the biggest crowd on Friday afternoon. Their win over Austin double wide to bounce the defending champs. Nice help on the poach there from Eric Johnson. Can't poach everything, though. That's a beautiful throw. Huck for Huck, they go. Joel Slackett ties the game at three. Now you could tell that Revolver wanted the Huck earlier, but it wasn't there. And finally, Ashland Joy realizes he's got a throwing lane. Perfect float, perfect angle, and really an easy catch for Schlackett. And it's plays like that, you know, you know, you mentioned that Johnny Bravo double wide game that where the whole crowd is gathered around. If you've never watched Ultimate before, that's the type of game you want to get initiated with, where the crowd is there, everybody is ooing and aahing as the game goes back and forth, and it's usually point for point. And it was a team full of excitement as well. That, you know, he probably threw that about 55, 60 yards in the air maybe about 20 yards shy of his own end zone line and, you know, 15 yards deep into the end zone. The field is narrower than a football field or a soccer field, just 40 yards wide, 110 yards from the back of one end zone to the other. Takes a 90-yard pull to throw it out the back. On a windy day, you see it occasionally. On a windless night, you don't see it very often. Offensive point here for Bravo, tied 3-3. Talk again, Bravo to Snyder. Waiting on the call. There's a pick call, didn't affect. So the dish should stay. Starting in one when, when you caught it. And it's right on the doorstep, no score. So it'll take at least one more pass if Bravo can take a 4-3 lead. Mickle was the first man to break from the pack. Is he across the goal line? Indeed he is. Jimmy Mickle scores again, and it's 4-3 Denver. It's really incredible how seamless Jimmy Mickle has fit in to Johnny Bravo. Nice job to pull down this huck, and nothing Yokawa Oka, one of the revolver captains, could do. A little flip to Mickle. He may have had his feet on the ground when he first touched that disc, but able to make it look as if he was up and landed in the end zone. First point of contact after possession, and. You know, four goals, and Mickle's been in part, been a part of almost all of them. Were his feet on the ground here? No. He had released that left foot. Maybe. I don't think so. Looks like that left foot was down. Nick Lance to pull for Bravo. Nice shot from our crew. Nick Lance. Holes for Johnny Bravo, San Francisco. Back about 10 yards deep in the end zone. Maybe one day Mike Pan will pull a red flag out of his sock and throw it on the field, but not this day. Seeing a little bit of zone defense here now from Johnny Bravo. Mike, one thing to note about Nationals this year, the top three finishers are guaranteed bids to the world team games, which are coming up this coming year. So if you win this game, you're guaranteed a bid in the world games. Bo Kittredge has plenty of space. He skies and through traffic. Kittredge converts for San Francisco. Shades of the U.S. Open in Raleigh. Kittredge uses all of his 6-2 frame to come down to the end zone. Bo Kittredge at times is Barry Sanders. 
Barry Sanders-like because of his ability to make impossible moves look so simple. And afterwards, he always looks like he's done it before. That was almost identical to the final point of the U.S. Open, except everyone emerged healthy. If you're watching at home or on your Watch ESPN app, use the hashtag there. Put Ultimate on Sports Center tonight. That hashtag SC Top 10. And you know what? I have a feeling we may use that again for more Bo Kittredge plays, if not tonight, tomorrow, if Revolver does get that far. If you're on Sports Center tonight, Mike, you're becoming sort of a Sports Center item. <laughs> T tell, tell the Ultimate fans about the time when you were calling a basketball game and you got attacked in the arena by a bat. Yeah, in Milwaukee, uh, Marquette Providence game, the, the bat game back in, uh, back in January. That was a good time. Were you scared? I wasn't because you know what? Bats are not carnivores. I've seen a picture of you and your color analyst that night really huddled up Sean, close together. Sean Carney, we had a good time that night. <laughs> Foul called on the contact. Oh. Ackley hit on the throw. Bo Kittredge, just a different type of athlete. What's so yeah. interesting about watching him is that you can just tell is that his natural athleticism, he's not running 100%. And it's not because he's lazy, it's because he doesn't have to. Yeah, he his athleticism is better. He doesn't go to his A gear wait, unless wait, wait. he absolutely needs to. Most of the time he's going B gear, and he's still faster than anybody going deep to the end zone. Also, we should mention an accomplished author and illustrator as well. The author of, among other titles, Unbroken and No No Kitty. Writes, Lucky enough to get autographed copies. Writes and illustrates his own run of children's books. And yeah, he sent both of us autographed copies after the U.S. Open. After starting them on Thursday, I finally finished reading them this morning. A little bit above my reading level. That was a big time D right there. We are on serve right now. This would be a break for San Francisco if Revolver converts. Gilligan with a huck down field. And that's too far over the head of Mac Taylor. And that was a nice try because Taylor got separation, but the forehand flick was a little bit too strong. Yeah, he wanted to throw it inside out. And it ended up going outside in and faded away from Taylor. He had no shot. That's all about the release point and how the disc and the thrower's wrist are angled. Watson puts it in play, spinning it for Westbrook. Back in his own end zone, forced away. He hucks that way. It's Watson on the run. Time to leap. And it's Deed, two on one. Revolver with the advantage, and they get the turn. That was about a 70-yard huck right there. Defended well by a duo of Revolver defenders. Led by Russell Wynn. Who now controls the disc, standing at the 30. Pick called. While both teams have been unafraid to throw the disc deep here in this first half. Neither has shown a lack of discipline. No, they've done a nice job making the right choice. Revolver will call a timeout here to regroup a little bit. After a couple turnovers on this point, Revolver another chance to go for the break. There's a head coach, Mike Payne, in the black with the cap on. Quickly, I always a smile on his face. So here's what's at stake. Seattle Sockeye with a double game point win over Boston Ironside tomorrow, 5 Eastern, 4 Central here on ESPN3, the Watch ESPN app. And that will be the third and final game 
of the USA Ultimate Championship weekend here in Frisco with the mixed and women's championship games to precede that. Mike Payne will be smiling a lot more tomorrow if he's coaching on the sidelines against Seattle. You know, we sort of anticipated a possible matchup of San Francisco and Seattle in the women's division. That will not be. Washington, D.C. scandal upended Seattle's riot. Really a blowout in the women's semifinal action here today. So San Francisco's fury will face the team from the East Coast in the women's championship game. That's a 2.30 start time. 1.30 Central here in Frisco tomorrow. There's a big chance for a Bay Area sweep this weekend with Polar Bears in the mixed side making its way into the championship game. Of, co of course, Fury as well under head coach Matty Sang. And then if Revolver is able to move on in this game, it could be three for three, depending on how things go tomorrow. Revolver has a lot of work to do, but you're right. In each division, a San Francisco team remains here on Saturday night. And Revolver with a chance to get a break here. Mac Taylor. Deed up, and it's Revolver that gets the goal. Sometimes it's easier to knock it down. Johnny Bravo Snyder knocked it right to the hands of Russell Wynn. Zach Travis off the deflection. A great D. You know what was interesting there is that in transition, nobody came up to mark Tim Gilligan. So he had all day to look at whatever he wanted into the end zone. Well, Bravo was scrambling. His revolver had worked it up the field and was just on the doorstep. And that wasn't a great throw from Gilligan, but as you said, sometimes better be lucky than good. Now revolver's up a break. You begin to worry about Johnny Bravo if Revolver could go up probably three breaks. That might be an insurmountable deficit, not because Bravo isn't an uber-athletic team, but Revolver's not the type of team that blows leads. They're so disciplined, so consistent, and so deep that when Revolver gets up, very rarely do they give that lead back. And the first break here in the first half is also the first lead for San Francisco. And it's also the first time that Bo Kittredge will play a defensive point. And he'll play this defensive point because he was not on the field the last point. Defensive point that Revolver scored. Bo usually just plays defense. He's out there guarding Jimmy Mickle and what's a fantastic matchup of two great Mama Bird studs. Past and present. Josh Ackley, the sideline tiptoe, dumps back for Watson. Everybody in the stands wants to see a huck to Mickle and see if he can go up over Bo. Right now, the two of them are locked together at midfield. Here's Mickle. Travel was called down in the field on Ackley. And the observer rules that it was a bad call, no travel. So Mikko waits for Kittredge to tap it in. Watson holds, forced home. Breaks the mark back to the middle of the field for Ackley. And a vertical stack for Denver. Travel called here. You see travel? I, I, I wasn't looking at it. Okay. Got to admire the honesty. Fair enough. Simply enough, Clore. they'll just send it back the into the hands of Jackson Clore. 
Denver with the disc trailing 5-4 here in the first half. This is Nick Lance, yet another Callahan Award winner. He took home the award in 2012 at Georgia Tech. Just another weapon on the stacked Bravo team. And Mickle, the end zone flick past Kittredge, finds Ackley, tied up at five. That entire sentence, Mick Mickle past Kittredge to Ackley, full of former Colorado Mama Bird stars. Take us through this vertical stack. Well, it allows Mickle to go to work. And then the quick throw. That was technically a break as Bo didn't really get a strong mark on. More of a straight up mark regardless. And an easy score from Mickle to Ackley. Third assist now for Mickle, who's been a big part of this. A goal and three assists out of the five goals for Denver. So he's had his hand at 80% of the score. He's just 22 years old. There's Bob Cryer. Works as an engineer. Played for Johnny Bravo before he came the coach, similar to Sockeye head coach Roger Crafts, who was a longtime mainstay in the Seattle championship teams in the mid-2000s. But Johnny Bravo has been a contender for a long time, but never won a title. You have San Francisco, that won two years ago and three years ago. And then Seattle Sockeye, the other team still alive. Champions three times in four years from 04 to 07. The women's bracket, you have the seven time defending champ, San Francisco Fury, looking for eight in a row against Washington D. Scandal looking to break through with its first title. Nick Schlag with an ice hammer really opened up this possession for San Francisco. And a foul called there. Could have used the contact wait call to keep things set. going. Colin, Colin, wait till you're set, wait till you're set. One-handed snag. That's a beautiful catch right along the line for Josh Wiseman. An, ori an original member of this Revolver team, a Stanford alum. Let's see how this goal developed. First, the hammer to create space. Kittredge has really improved his throwing ability. And a little bit of a risky throw after the foul. Nearly a big layout D. But just a little bit short, Jackson Clore and Weissman. Revolver back in front, 6-5 here in the first half. At this point of the day, it's about as chilly as it's been for these teams. You think about Texas, wherever you're coming from, Warmer weather at this time of the year, but once the sun sets here, it's time to put on a jacket, maybe a sweatshirt too. Yeah, it's been in the 40s. Or grow your beard out. In the early mornings, perhaps high 40s, low 50s in the evenings. That's Alex Brammer, and you know, all week long I've walked around the fields, I haven't seen a better beard than Alexander Brammer, the 24-year-old from Revolver. Although we don't see them here on semifinal Saturday, I do have to give credit to the gentlemen from Sub-Zero who were all sporting, so long as they could grow them, pretty slick mustaches. You say slick. <laughs> I might have another adjective. <laughs> well, we won't ask their mothers for input on that. Rare turn from Bravo. They haven't done that often here in the first half. And now this is the opening for Revolver. There's Alex Brammer. What's longer, the hair on the top or the beard? Yeah, the beard. And he's, he's the champion in the beard department in the open division, in the men's division, I would say. <laughs> Josh Ackley shaking up the 
Injury timeout, Mac Taylor comes off for Revolver. One of their big weapons on offense. Substitutions only allowed when there's an injury or after a score. And if there's an injury and the injured player departs, the opposing team is given the option of taking a sub as well. So it's equal. Russell Wynn, stall count climbing. Harvers it off just to his right, and a pick called as the catch was made by Sam Kenner. Up line, Levy. He goes end zone. What footwork. And Revolver goes up two scores. Now a bunch of things to note there for Russell Wynn as Revolver picks up another break. The awareness of where he is in the field is one thing, but the athleticism to get those toes inbounds. You know, he was scarily close to the sideline, and his hands almost ended up hitting first but he did get the toe touch inbounds. Revolver putting Bravo in a dangerous position here. This is basically a must score for Denver because if Revolver goes up 8-5 at the half and receives the disc to start the second half, San Francisco would be on its way. First goal for Russell Wynn, and that turn for Bravo was the eighth of the half for Denver. You can't afford very many against a team like Revolver. And that's the thing about you know San Francisco. They're just so solid, and they have the star players, but they don't necessarily rely on them like other teams do because they're so solid everywhere, up and down the roster. Mike Payne really proud of how some of the younger players have played, and... You know, the fact that some of the young players did look so good on Thursday and Friday permitted some of the studs to gain a little more rest and be just an ounce or two fresher here on Saturday night. Foul called on this throw. It's coming back. Little zone defense. Three-man cup at the very beginning of the point, and quickly the cup disintegrated and picked up the other handlers. So this just comes back to Nick Lance. Uh, they're going to be a sack. After an uncontested foul. Nick Lance with the disc for Bravo. Once again, you have Kittredge guarding Mickle down the field. Mickle's going deep. Here we go. Mickle out in front of Kittredge. Bo jumps too early. Mickle can't get it. And the disc falls. In the end zone. Well, a little anticlimactic, but the pressure that Kittredge put on, the closing speed, Mickle knew he was coming, and a bit of a misread from Jimmy. He heard the footsteps. He's about nine years Kittredge's junior. Kittredge you know, with the disc, and if San Francisco scores here, they take half. Bo trying the huck, and he's got it. Boy, nice throw from Kittredge. Mac Taylor back in the game. He dishes end zone, and Revolver with the goal takes half over Johnny Bravo, 8-5. And that is why San Francisco is so dangerous. Two of its best offensive weapons with great passes downfield. Kittrich's reputation more than anything else helped to get the D. His throws have gotten so much better these last couple years. Not the greatest form, but perfect execution. 
Patrick Bayless comes down with the catch and finishes off a first half for San Francisco where they went five for six in the red zone. So a tough look now for Johnny Bravo trailing 8-5 at the break. Their head coach, Bob Cryer, now joining us down on the sideline. And Bob, to go into half 8-5 against Revolver, what is it going to be that you'll need to do toward the second half to try and turn things around? Well, first of all, we have to stop their hooks uh, from their offense. Uh, Ashland's been playing great, and we have to find a way to stop him from getting those open looks. And if we can get the disc out of his hands and, and uh, put the pressure on their handlers, uh, get some turns, that'll be the, the recipe. Bob, the fact that these two teams know each other so well with guys who have played for both teams, how do you think that's impacting the game, if at all? Um, we, we know a lot of what they want to do. We know how, how influential Bo can be and Mac, and uh, so we have strategies for them. They know us, so they, they know who our huckers are. You can hear them calling that uh, when our big throwers have the disc, so their downfield cutters know. Um, other than that, like, it's, it's a very good-spirited game because a lot of good friends on these teams. Certainly, Bob. Thanks, and good luck in the second half. Thank you. Bob Cryer, head coach of Denver, Johnny Bravo. They're down 8-5 at the break. We'll come back, look at the first half highlights here with San Francisco in front. San Francisco Revolver, USA Ultimate Champions in 2010, 2011. Last year, knocked off by Austin double wide. But now here at half, they lead 8-5 with a trip to the championship game on the line, leading Johnny Bravo by three. With Evan Lepler, Mike Cousins, thanks for being with us here on this Saturday night here in Texas. And in this first half, things were close for Denver and San Francisco to start. But it's a troublesome spot now for Johnny Bravo to be down by three. You said it. Two, maybe three breaks was all it takes, would all it would be all it would take for Revolver to try and pull away. And Revolver does get the disc to start the second half. Johnny Bravo's defense is going to need to step up. And you think about the big picture. This is a Revolver team that won the U.S. Open. They were the number one team through the regular season. They're trying to pull off the Triple Crown in the inaugural year of the Triple Crown Tour. An 8-5 lead at halftime over a really good Johnny Bravo team, and they just made fewer mistakes, and as we see the highlights, we'll see why. Yeah, very few turns for both sides, but if you're Johnny Bravo, the Denver squad, you can't afford to make mistakes against Revolver because their depth is so good. They have players who can do it all, not just throw, but also lay out and score. Well, a couple deflected discs worked out for Revolver. That was a nice play by Josh Ackley on the sideline. A marathon first point, and Bravo did get on the board first. Revolver, an easy huck for Ashland Joy, one of the U.S. World Game stars. And here's another as Bo Kittredge up high for a just effortless, unbelievable play. You, you run out of superlatives to, to describe this guy. You know, Jimmy Mickle, a, a, an incredible young player too, but he had some opportunities to make a few more plays in the half that he did not make. He made a bunch of plays too, almost every Denver score Mickle was involved in, but San Francisco as a team doing things a little bit better. That's why they're up 8-5. Mike Payne standing down on the sideline, the head coach of Revolver, and uh, looking at all of your weapons here, up 8-5. We know that you like to spread things around with your team. There's no one superstar. The first half showed that. And what's your message to the team here to try and continue this effort from the first half? Well, I mean, I think that we do have the depth. Um, we basically have played everybody on the team. 27 guys have played. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. I mean, this is a fast-paced game, and Bravo is a really athletic team. Uh, but we feel like we have at least two lines of D players that can go up against their O players. So I think you saw some fatigue. Uh, creep in for the Bravo O in that first half and we're going to continue to push them in the second half and hopefully they'll give us some frisbees. Mike, obviously there's a lot of talent in the Bay Area, but how do you foster this kind of depth in the semifinals of a national championship tournament? Well, I think, you know, we had some good results during the year, but we also lost some games and part of that was we, in general, uh, try to sacrifice wins if we have to early in the season to work on individual improvement and our overall uh, team strategy. So we have eight new players on the team this year, and some of the guys that were making big plays in that first half are guys that have never played at the club level before. And they've got the complete package because we've been investing them as in them as individuals, and we've also been making sure they're incorporated into the overall team. San Francisco head coach Mike Payne with the 8-5 lead. Thanks for the time. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Uh, that team philosophy paying off. We heard it in July at the U.S. Open. The dividends here with an 8-5 lead at the break.
San Francisco Revolver takes half against Johnny Bravo out of Denver, 8-5. Well distributed all around. San Francisco finishes the half on a 3-0 run. And, Evan, we just heard from Mike Payne to say, the guys that are shining here today, we played all 27 players. This is what we set up for in the regular season to make sure we could spread things out. And it doesn't really matter who scores the goals or who assists on the goals because they're all a byproduct of the offensive system that's led them to two championships in the past three years, trying to make it three out of four. Up by three, and San Francisco will receive the opening pole. That's when we return here to Frisco, Texas. San Francisco in Denver in front of a big crowd here at Frisco ISD Memorial Stadium. A bit of a chilly evening for a Texas night, but San Francisco taking half, and they've got their eyes set on it tomorrow if they're able to carry the momentum into the second half. They would take on number seven seed Seattle Sockeye that played one of the best games of the weekend earlier today as they took down Boston Ironside. Most impressive thing about Seattle's performance, the offensive efficiency. Boston usually a defensive team that can create turnovers and breaks but really not many chances today. Seattle so steady. Going to be a good final tomorrow. San Francisco receiving, trying to go up 9-5 to begin the second half. We've got about 30 minutes until the soft cap goes on in this game but three breaks 8-5. Now if Revolver scores on this possession They've still got to do a lot more scoring, but that really creates a Mount Everest type scenario for Denver. Well, and here's the first turnover that Bravo's looking for. This is not an insurmountable deficit by any means, but you know, typically Revolver's consistency prevents them from blowing three goal leads at halftime. Mike Payne, San Francisco's coach, with an intriguing statement at halftime to say, we are willing to sacrifice wins for the development of players. Here's the thing. It's easy for him to say that, but they still win a <laughs> heck of a lot. I mean, going into the U.S. Open, their goal was to get better, to improve, and they won the thing. I mean, it was a universe point victory in the finals against Boston Ironside, but a win's a win, and they got back to travel back cross country as the U.S. Open champions. San Francisco huck too long. Denver's hawk to the goal line and a call right at the yellow marker. Negating what would be a score. A lot going on right here. Kittredge went up for the D I and it looked like he had definitely it. Definitely a shove. Okay. I'm not entirely sure who shoved whom. Defense is calling a shove. I saw White get pushed in the back. Yep. Okay. You guys send it back or send it to us? I have no idea. I also called foul, but they, we got hit. No, right, so, so this is the continuation here. <laughs> All right. No, it's the throw. The throw. So they're just going to contest it and send it back to the thrower. It sounded like if they decided to go to the observers, it'd be Revolver's disc. There's a push right there, although it may be a product of more contact overall. It looked like a Revolver player pushed a Revolver player. That was Nathan White who had the push, although he may have been pushed as well, causing yeah. his forward momentum. I think Kittredge pushed White into the Bravo player. You know, this is probably the fairest call. Since it seemed like nobody was really sure where the actual foul occurred. Eric Johnson making an explosive run. They didn't find him. Jack McShane gets the touch. He goes up line to Snyder. Nearly turf. They keep it alive. He fakes the hammer and dumps on a flat. There was a pick down field. The disc is going to stay where it's at, though. The defensive player that gets picked makes the call. And when play stops, he's allowed to catch up to make up the ground that he would have gained if not for the screen. McShane playing catch with Johnson. Nice grab by the fingertips. Nice recovery. 
And it's deed away. Kittredge gets the hand block and a big turn for San Francisco. He's not usually guarding handlers, so you don't see a ton of Kittredge hand blocks, but obviously his wingspan is massive. Totally clean play. There were no fakes thrown in, but Revolver gives it right back. Crossfield hammer. Jackson Clore's got it. Barely in bounds. Now Johnson. Stall count rising. And his flick an easy one to Hilker Snyder. What we've seen from the revolver defense near the goal line, they often go straight up with their mark. First of all, the hammer and a very solid catch by Clore near the sideline. But Revolver is going to basically go with a straight up mark here. And that puts a lot of pressure on the defense. Basically trying to prevent the straight up field throw, but the flick to space, pretty simple. And if the cutter's defender doesn't have one side that he can guess is an advantage, makes it much tougher. Teams are used to guarding with forces. Important there to get a break for Bravo and not go down by an even bigger margin of what would be 9-6. Rather, I should say 9-5. There's a look at Bo Kittredge. You've already seen one big sky from him today. Bo originally from Fairbanks, Alaska. So this is not cold for him. <laughs> it's all relative, right? He did say that at the US Open in Raleigh, it was one of the hottest conditions he ever played in. Well, that was hot. You did see a lot of heat exhaustion there, especially toward the end of the game for a team like Austin double wide. Another turn for San Francisco, but double wide was short players, and that certainly didn't help when you got a roster of about 18, and you can go, you know, 25, 26, 27. That was off the hands of Josh Wiseman. A throw he should have had, but it was a little high, and a rare turnover charged to Kittredge. McShane and Farrell exchange dumps right near midfield. Hammer downfield, this hangs, there's contact, grab is made. And that's a beautiful finish to the point for Johnny Bravo, two in a row for Denver to come back within one. Stanley Peterson, a fantastic catch. Two straight breaks after halftime from Denver's Bravo. A daring and dangerous throw from Jack McShane. And a well-timed leap from Peterson. Just 21 years old, but very advanced for his age. Another current Mama Bird star. It's good to be tall. It's good to be able to leap. And it's nice to get a jacket handed to you when you come off the field after a score on a chilly night. Seven goals for Denver, scored by six different players. Both teams sharing that similar philosophy of spreading around the wealth. And now as it turns back to the pole here for Bravo, it'll come from Matty Zemmel. How will San Francisco respond after giving up two straight breaks? Great question. Bo Kittredge playing his third straight offensive point to begin the second half. One of the things Revolver doesn't do is move away from its system in times of distress. Part of the mental toughness 
They had Kittredge come in, creates a lot of space going deep, and that's clockwork for Revolver. Just calmly they break Bravo's momentum. Marcelo Sanchez to Patrick Bayless. And that's part of the threat of keeping Kittredge underneath. He faked going deep downfield, gets this in cut, and that helps set up the score. 20 yard throw from Kittredge and then Sanchez. A lot of space. I think that's actually oh, Devin that was Anderson. Devin Anderson. I apologize. You're forgiven. That looks like an eight from here. And even from down there, if you could, you know. In some fonts, some more of the out there fonts, that would be an eight. So I'm keeping track of your mistakes, Mike, and we won't count that one. <laughs> eight different players to score. So take the goal total minus one for both teams. Six different players on seven goals for Denver. Eight different players on nine scores for San Francisco. Just promise me you're not keeping track of my mistakes. <laughs> Poaching a little bit early in the point, leaving the other handlers open. Now they pick him up. If Alex Brammer has the best beard in the tournament, Jesse Ream might have the most interesting hair. And it's by a long shot. And as we mentioned in semifinal game number one, with Ironside from Boston losing on double game point, how it was reminiscent of the finals of the U.S. Open in Raleigh back in July. Well, this game for San Francisco Revolver has been similar to that final as well with great distribution. And I think in that game it was 11 or 12 different players scoring goals. So Mickle on the continuation will keep the disc. Up line is Snyder, back to Mickle. I had a pick call. Pick call. Jimmy Mickle with the dinner for Bravo. Word is that subsequently they fall. Mickle forced backhand, says, OK, I'll take that. And he goes right to the end zone. Hungry for a score, Josh Ackley pulls it in from Mickle. I'm going to have to see this again. How did he get so wide open? Oh, the defender just got turned around completely. Yeah, he turns, and Nick Schlag just doesn't get his feet around in time. Caught in the turf a little bit. So Ackley finds the end zone again. A huge start to the second half here for Bob Cryer and Johnny Bravo. Scoring three of the first four points since halftime, including two breaks, because Revolver did start the second half on offense with a disc. Johnny Bravo, a longtime powerhouse in the mountains in the Rockies, but never a national champion. Bravo, one of the final three still standing in 2013. In order to be in the final two, they'll need to beat the tournament favorite, the regular season champ, the US Open champ. May have been a pick away from the play. And it was. Checked in by Anderson. Out to the 50 for Kittredge. He looks long. Revolver with a chance for double digits. And Kittredge's flick huck too long. 
and had a decent amount of float on it, but needed a little bit more. Joel Schlackett with a solid effort. Comes up a little bit short. Evan, you touched on it earlier, but the development of Bo Kittredge as a complete offensive player, the big part of that is still the evolution of his throws. Yeah, well, he's always been an outrageous athlete from a track and field sprinting background. Obviously, he's got remarkable strides, and he accelerates unlike anybody else in the game. When he played at college, he was basically just an athlete, and he would catch the disc deep and then look for a dump, and he had the, the short dump throws, but you wouldn't really see him huck it, you know, 45, 50 yards often. That's changed as he's developed more as a complete club player. There were times in the world games when, you know, some other nations would just try to totally force him underneath, and he would burn him on hucks. And Kittredge playing the handler spot here. It's a swing, a quick break. And off the Bravo turn, that's a score for Revolver as Jordan Jeffrey finishes the point for San Francisco, the first to double digits. And from Revolver's perspective, that's a very important hold to keep that two-goal gap. Offense, after a few turnovers, does convert. And now you let the offense rest. You let the defense get back out there. Nice, calm, relaxed flick from Kittredge and to the end zone. And that's now nine different players to score on 10 goals for San Francisco. And we saw Bo Kittredge there take pass number two of the offensive play. Interesting not to see him as part of a stack, but rather along the handler line. And you don't see that all that often. But he's certainly capable and you know, sometimes handlers can lull their defenders to sleep and then take off, and obviously Kittredge could cover the length of the field in about seven steps. Sam Canner's pull goes five yards deep into the Bravo end zone. Mac Taylor is guarding Jimmy Mickle this point. Tough mark. D attempt there from Andrew Hagan, no call, so it's back to San Francisco, short field. And right on the other side, the D comes from Craig Forshee and puts it back into Denver's hands. That was a huge D from the Michigan State alum. Pick was called. Coming in one. You guys get? Oh, no contest. That's Owen Westbrook with a dish for Bravo. Owen Westbrook checks it in for Denver's Johnny Bravo. Down 10 8. A lot of great layouts by the handler defenders. No contest on that foul. Ackley bumped by Wynn. You mentioned Westbrook. Bravo considers him really a calm, stabilizing force on offense. Every team needs players like that and players like Revolver's defense. That's Martin Cochran who returned to Revolver midseason. Former Colorado Mama Bird star and Johnny Bravo stalwart. That looked like a clean D from my perspective by Cochran. And he chats with Jesse Ream. They try and figure out where the contact was made. Go to the observer, and the call is no foul. Yeah. So it's revolver desk. Yes. I'm not calling the strip. Okay. I'm calling that he hit my hand as I'm going up. All right. Observer ruling, no foul. Wait, wait, wait. But we're in the No. Also, also no foul. Hey, Bravo, 
right now. And that's a good the job by the observer there. Not yet. Wait for him to tap the ground. To make sure the play continues quickly and not allow ground. for deliberation after the call has been made. And that's one of the important parts of being an observer in the sport of ultimate. Ultimate created under the foundation of spirit of the game. Observer is a great compromise between having no arbiters and then having true referees. And one of the things I love about Ultimate is the fact that it doesn't have referees because you don't see any of the flopping that you see in other sports like basketball or soccer or even football. If there are referees who are entrusted in making every single call, you naturally try to act a little bit and embellish for those referees. You don't see any acting or embellishment in Ultimate. I pick on him and I had steps. Right? Were you no, no. I didn't think you were in front of me. All right. Go there. <laughs> See, this is what happened. He was here, and then he called pick on him. That's what I thought, too. So get around him. And I had two steps. No, you did not have two steps. He not, no, he's not there, right? <laughs> he is pretty close to there. Hey, wait, can wait, you wait, take wait, two wait. steps in? Hey, wait, wait, wait. All right, that's yeah, good. It's a repositioning. Hey, Sam Kennedy, right, number 12 in white. Here. And Mac Taylor also asked to, to take two, two steps in. Tap the ground Jesse Raymond, right. Jimmy Mickle on the defense for Denver and Red. He'll be doing the hokey pokey before we know it. <laughs> Pick called again in the end zone as contact was made. And Jesse Ream, number three in red, went down to the turf. Andrew Hagen controls it right now for Revolver on the doorstep of a score. Flick ahead for Mac Taylor. And the goal is good for Revolver. It's 11 8 San Francisco. And that's a break for the Revolver defense. Led by Mac Taylor. Yet another Colorado product playing for the San Francisco team. Got the first point of contact inbounds, and that's all he needs. So a couple breaks by Denver, and now the break from San Francisco. That's really what Revolver needed to reestablish that three-goal cushion here and make things a little bit more comfortable for themselves as they look to play themselves into a Sunday Revolver matchup tomorrow against here. Seattle Sakai. Certainly, Revolver back in control here, up by three. Ten different players have scored the 11 goals for San Francisco, but many more than that have contributed. It's not like somebody scores and they say, okay, you can't score again. They're not trying to create the versatility. It's just a natural byproduct of their system. Josh Ackley's been very solid for Johnny Bravo. Offensive point here for Denver. Revolver offside on that pull. And Revolver offside, so they'll pull again. They actually caught a break because the pull was going out of bounds. <laughs> was going to come out to the brick mark. So their first offsides here in the second half will give them another chance to keep it in bounds. It was interesting that watching Austin play earlier this weekend, talking with Kurt Dahlenberg. He said, you know what? It's Nice to have a strong pull, but not too strong. Otherwise, you're giving yourself a 25-yard penalty. You know, with the win, we saw Kurt Gibson for double wide numerous times throw it out the back of the end zone. And, and there's really no difference between throwing it out the back of the end zone, throwing it 100 yards, and throwing it 50 yards, you know, either down the middle or out of bounds on the sideline. Right along the goal line, Denver trying to get out of pressure. I do think the receiving team should have the option to decline the offside because Bravo may have wanted to start on the brick mark there. Which is where they are right now and where the big huck comes from. Denver with the answer. Forget the penalty. Ryan Farrell runs down the big backhand throw. Farrell, super solid in so many ways. From the East Coast, he played a year with 
pride of New York, Pony. And now one of the key guys on Bravo. No, it meant a lot to him to knock off double wide yesterday and help to lead this team all the way to the semis. But he's not satisfied. We haven't mentioned his name all that much. He told me that the key to playing great handler defense is simply staying home and not going for fakes. Easier said than done. Probably handler defense, the toughest thing in ultimate because they're short throws. The thrower and the receiver can make eye contact. But great defenders, oftentimes it looks like they know where the offensive player is going before the offensive player knows. Good offensive line out there for San Francisco. Schlag, Sanchez, Joy, White, Kittredge among the seven. Now Nick Schlag is another guy that we may not talk about a lot, but picking up the disc, a primary handler, one of the four captains of this San Francisco team. And, and we have not mentioned Cassidy Rasmussen's name today. He was a key player in the US Open, but he has not been on the field during the semifinal. Looks like Bo's all right after the oh, incidental stay? contact with Jack oh, McShane. see where the contact comes for Kittredge. Maybe a blow around the shoulders? He got hit on the side, but he's staying out there. About five minutes away from the soft cap going on. Fleckhawk, great contest in the end zone. Was there a call? Nick Lance getting up for Denver, Johnny Bravo. Hard landing for Lance. Great timing on the D. Lance is gonna jog off the field. Not bad when you have a guy with the credentials of Bart Watson to stroll on and take his place. You know, Watson is 32, Lance is 23. Nine years apart, both still great players. All right, freeze, freeze. Bart, no idea how many more years right. at the elite level he will play, but Certainly Nick Lance just beginning his club tenure. After Lance dees it out of the back of the end zone, Watson takes it right to the goal line. And there he's got Ashland Joy waiting for him. Straight up mark. Taylor a good bid and a Callahan try. Good matchup there is. Taylor marks up Jimmy Mickle. And a pick call. Pick call. Hey, coming in one. Now just about three minutes away from the soft cap going on, looking less and less like this will be a game to 15. Are you guys set? All right, still coming in one. Mickle marked by Taylor. Bravo's had a couple breaks in this game, but Bravo has never been ahead by a break. Looking for Mickle. No, sir. The backhand throw too strong. Mickle had the separation he wanted getting in front of Taylor. That time he did everything he could, but the throw just wasn't there. You can see him grimacing just a little bit. He throws his body around. A little too much angle on that throw from Watson. You could see Bart's reaction. Frustrated with himself. One of the things that the revolver captains know, and Johnny Bravo knows just as well, when Bart Watson makes a mistake, doesn't happen too often, typically he avenges that mistake. 
We'll keep an eye on him here. Last possession where Kittredge was on the field, he was in a handler spot. Now in a cutter roll, he's overthrown. The turn gives it back to Denver. Into the hands of Watson, trying to avenge the turn. And a pick call. No call. Just as rare, a bad throw from Ashland Joy. You know, two national team caliber players with uncharacteristic errors. So this is turning into somewhat of an epic point. If Bravo can win it, all of a sudden it's a one-score game. You don't really think of the clock, but it would be huge if Bravo could score this in less than 60 seconds before the soft cap goes on. Prevent the soft cap from going on until after the next point. But I can speak from experience. When you're on the field, you very rarely are aware what the time cap is. Layout by McShane, and he keeps it off the turf. You're right now with 30 seconds to go toward the soft cap. Rarely is it that you play in a multi-thousand seat venue with a scoreboard to tell you how much time remains. That's a great point. That was an unbelievable play by McShane. 50-50 hammer, deed up. Kittredge there to knock it away. Mickle, one of the intended recipients, along with him going for that disc, was Snyder, Hilkus Snyder. Okay. Snyder, a Johnny Bravo player who currently lives in Holland in medical school, joins Bravo for a bunch of the big tournaments. So the soft cap will go on after this point. It'll either be game to 13 or game to 14, depending how this point wraps up. Looking for Kittredge. He's wide open. Bo Kittredge can walk home. It'll be game to 14. You don't usually see defenders peeling off. Players are taught to never, ever give up on the disc. But you can see Jimmy Mickle's body language on the left of your screen right before Bo Kittredge had a walking catch for the score. Hey, it's a tough, it's a tough defensive assignment there for Hilke Snyder to try and go one on one with Bo Kittredge. His only, only his second goal of the game. But when you've got no help over the top, akin to a safety in football, I mean, good luck. Yeah. Well, if this was football, and you could double team him a little easier, you would. He's certainly worthy of a double team. But there's no such thing. You know, it's not like you don't rush the quarterback. You don't, you need to still mark the handler. You can't leave somebody wide open. Even though Kittredge was totally wide open and Ashland Joy hit him right in stride. It's a solid pull, it hung up there about 10, 15 yards deep in the end zone. Denver, Watson with the disc, flings up field and a game to 14. Nice job by Revolver switching after the poach attempt resulted in a layout. A couple of Revolver players were streaking deep, uh, Bravo players streaking deep rather, and Revolver adjusted well. Cross field, that's a D for Revolver, clean interception. And a timeout taken by San Francisco. You're at a crucial juncture of this game. Andrew Hagen was able to step in front, grab the D. And so with two points needed to win it and move on to tomorrow's championship game, Mike Payne's San Francisco team chooses a great spot to use their first time out of the half. Revolver takes a timeout. 
Championship Sunday tomorrow, and it'll start with the mixed action. Minneapolis and San Francisco, that's going to be a recurring theme here for our championship matches, is a team from the Bay Area in California. Dragon Thrust knocked off the Ghosts from Boston, San Francisco Polar Bears, a team that's been on the brink for a while now, representing the Bay Area in the championship game after defeating Wild Card, also a team from Boston. On the women's side, Washington, D.C. scandal with the surprise win over Seattle Riot, 15-7. The question will be tomorrow, A, can they upseed, or upset the seven-time defending champion, but really, can they keep their momentum going from what was one of their best games of the year earlier today? San Francisco's Fury is probably going to watch the archived ESPN3 footage of that scandal riot game this evening. They might be watching it right now. Probably on mute. They're gonna realize, <laughs> probably. They're gonna realize that scandal just played its best game of the year. And if scandal could play the same game it did today and, you know, dare I say, maybe even take it up one more notch, Fury may not win it again. But Fury has to be considered the favorite. Seven time defending national champs. Rare turn, that pass too long for Mac Taylor. So Mickle brings it in balance. This has proved a good matchup, is Mickle versus Taylor. Now Mickle on the hook, looking for Clore, and that backhand throw is too long. Mickle's been very involved. He's been very, very solid, but there have been some plays for him to make that, quite frankly, he hasn't made. And if you're going to beat the number one team in the land, a championship caliber squad and revolver, you got to take advantage of all the opportunities. Pick called. Pick called with the disc on the goal line right now for San Francisco. You know, I don't want to make it sound like I'm picking on Jimmy Mickle because, you know, he has been entrusted with such responsibility on this team, a team of great players like Nick Lance and Ryan Farrell and Josh Ackley and Bart Watson. But Mickle, just a dynamic talent. It's hard to believe that he'll still be competing in the college championships next May. Certainly a, a candidate to win the Callahan yeah, Award next year. This year going to Dylan Fairchild, one of the team's uh, rhino that was a little bit of a surprise not to end up. up Back to the thrower. Uh, it depends uh, if it's the infracted team. Dylan Freechild, I beg your pardon. So, uh, But that Rhino team out of Portland, uh, a bit of a surprise not to end up here in Frisco. Well, it's yeah. interesting. About a week yeah. and a half ago, posed the question on Twitter, who are the best teams uh, to not make happened? it to Frisco? And Rhino was a common choice. High five out of Michigan, a Six. common choice. That's fine. When they're, when you're ready. Also a few votes for Oakland Ultimate out of Pittsburgh, the team that everybody expected the Pitt Stars, DiGirolamo, and Thorne to play on, but they had an opportunity to join the defending champs. And don't underestimate the power of a phone call to see somebody switch to a team in Texas. And it's the first time in a very long time that DiGirolamo and Thorne aren't the winners at a national championship tournament. That's a score. That's a score. Wow. That's a powerful throw and a great catch by Sam Canner. You know, Revolver often plays it within its system, but don't forget that Revolver can strike really, really quickly. Mac Taylor, with a big foot Mac the Taylor Sam to Sam Canner, who didn't even realize he was in. And Jackson Clore goes down here. It looks like he gets caught up leg for leg. Canner was ready to turn and rip a backhand. Yeah, incidental contact there. So uh, a fortunate play for San Francisco, and that sets up a game point. There was a time in ultimate that if you caught it in the end zone and didn't acknowledge the score and set a pivot foot, you needed another throw. That rule was changed with observers calling him in for the, for the goal for revolver. It sounds silly, but I've seen it before, you know, eight, nine years ago, 
a guy would catch it in the end zone, not realize he was in the end zone, set a pivot foot, look to throw, and you'd have you know someone throwing in the end zone to another person in the end zone, and you know every once in a while you would see a turnover like that, and just a mental mistake, lack of field sense and awareness. Seems a sensible rule change. So this possession could be it for Denver. It needs to score. Game point for the revolver D-line. Marine with the disc, steps through to Watson. Now Mickle. The force away the whole time. He breaks it back toward midfield to McShane. He gives a contact call, they play through. Zone. Bravo gets the score it needed. Owen Westbrook finds himself open. It's 13-10. The job not done yet for San Francisco. Nice basic offense from Bravo. And now the challenge really starts. Bravo needs four breaks in a, row, in a row to win this game, and that is a tall task against anybody in Nationals, and probably nobody less likely to get broken four times in a row than this team with Devin Anderson, Bo Kittredge, Ashlyn Joy, Josh Wiseman. Nick Schlag out there as well. Jimmy Mickle and Bravo. With the work cut out for him. For excessive double teaming. Looks like we had a TMF called on that last possession on Revolver for excessive double teaming. Only one other time we saw that at least in person called, and it was against Austin double wide while utilizing a four-man cup. Don't think that call is going to be the difference in the game, though. <laughs> Kittredge with the catch out of the end zone. And so often, he's the first underneath cut initiating the offense. Well, he did that a lot at the World Games. Was a handler a lot, actually, because other teams were so scared of him going deep. This is game point for San Francisco. A score here, and the game is over. Had Kittredge, but it would have been a little bit of a tight window up the line, so Revolver ever patient. Slacking, and it's a turn for San Francisco. Ashlyn Joy trying the pancake catch, and it just slipped out of his hands. And Bravo will prolong this game, call a timeout. Denver timeout call. Still have one left after this one. <laughs> Seattle Sockeye. Double game point victory over Boston's Ironside. And, you know, Sockeye knocked the number two seed in the tournament, Goat, down in pool play. Sockeye with a win over Machine from Chicago in the quarterfinals and then taking down Boston. So Seattle gunning for its first title in six years. San Francisco won it all two years ago and three years ago. Lost a tight one to double wide last year. And you know, the story of last year was San Francisco just crushed, trounced double wide in pool play. But they would meet again and Double wide got off to a great start. Texas A&M star Dalton Smith had a huge D in the first point at Nationals last year. Really set the tone for double wide. Bravo looking for Mickle. He's got it. He needs one more pass. 
Mikko with the easy flick. Hilker Schneider. So out of the timeout, perfect execution by Denver. They're still down two. They've been resilient, though, because it's been an uphill climb here in the second half. Johnny Bravo trying to build up the energy right here. And Bob Cryer will try to keep his team rested. The timeout call certainly helped. Bo Kittredge, a rare stumble. It's a big play by Mickle. And now the pressure sits on the Bravo D as they get set to pull. They need to stop here to prevent Revolver from moving on to the finals. Mickle to pull again. Well, if Bravo could break things here, it would get very interesting. Remember, it's a game to 14 because the soft cap went on. So still game point for Revolver. And the trip to the finals would give Revolver a chance to complete the circuit on the Triple Crown Tour. Regular season champions, U.S. Open champions. Second week of July in Raleigh, North Carolina. And a matchup with Seattle Sockeye awaits tomorrow. This would do it for San Francisco. Into the end zone, and that's it. Revolver is on to the finals. It's a Seattle-San Francisco finale tomorrow. Josh Wiseman hauls in the game winner. And Revolver to the brink of a championship again. How impressive is it? Four straight years heading to the championship game. Solid effort from Bravo, but you know, the last couple points of the first half is when this game was really decided. Bravo got a few big breaks to take an 8-5 lead at the half. And Wiseman, the game winner. An original member of this Revolver team that was founded in 2006. Perfect angle on that flick. And Revolver celebrates great spirit between these two teams. A lot of friends among them, as we heard Bob Cryer talk about at halftime. Now let's take a look at our Discraft Ultra Star play of the game. Hashtag SC Top 10. Bo Kittredge doing what he does best. Not only using his speed, but his athleticism to beat the double team in Sky for the goal. There are a lot of players out there who would spike the disc, scream at the top of their lungs. Bo expects to make those kinds of plays. And when we come back, we'll get a chance to talk to him. San Francisco with the win. When we come back here to Frisco, Texas, we'll talk with Bo Kittredge down on the sideline. USA Ultimate National Championships are presented by the Discraft Ultrastar 175 Sport Disc, the official championship disc of USA Ultimate since 1991. The Triple Crown Tour, Ultimate's highest level of competition. Everyone's invited. USA Ultimate, the national governing body for the sport of Ultimate in the United States. To find out more about the sport of Ultimate or where to play in your community, visit www.usaultimate.org. San Francisco Revolver, a three-goal win here over Johnny Bravo of Denver. 14-11 our final here tonight in Frisco, Texas. And we welcome you back inside Frisco ISD Memorial Stadium with Evan Lepler, my cousins. And Evan, you said it before this game was over, and it was really right at the end of the first half, seems, when this was all decided. The Revolver defense made some plays late in the first half, took a three-break lead, 8-5 at the half, and they did the rest in the second half to head to the finals. 
Revolver's Bo Kittredge now joins us down on the sideline. And Bo, it seemed like this game was very reminiscent of the U.S. Open final for you against Boston Ironside, where the scoring was well distributed. And when we talk with Mike Payne, he always says that's a goal of yours. And was that a focus for today's game as well? Yeah, I think it always is a focus for us. We have such a deep team that uh, if we can spread it around, we can uh, save our legs for either later games or later points. Uh, teams like Bravo are really good, but they seem to use only about four or five players most of the time. Uh, and they kind of get really tired by the end. And hopefully we're more fresh because we distribute more. But nothing not to take anything away from Johnny Bravo. They're Bo, I know team. you're used to winning, but it's been an unbelievable summer for you. The U.S. Open, a victory. You go down to, to Cali with the U.S. national team and win the World Games. You, you win the second leg of the Triple Crown Tour for regular season and now on the brink of another championship. How, how does it feel to be heading back to the finals? It's a great feeling. I love being in the finals. I love playing in the finals. I've lost a lot of them, so I know what it's like to lose. Uh, and this time, you know, every every chance is another chance to try to not lose, which is maybe I, gotta, I should probably try to win <laughs> more than just lose. Well, uh, the, be the best athletes sometimes have a fear of losing that's even stronger than the will to win. Yeah. Hey, what was it like today going against so many guys that you knew, so many players on these two teams that have played for the other in the past? What was that dynamic like for you? I love it. I love playing against these guys. These guys are probably one of the most athletic teams, them and maybe double wide. They're a great team to match up against. You know you're going to get to, uh, you know, run as hard as you can and jump as high as you can and it still might not be good enough but at the end of the day uh it's a great it's a great matchup for our team because they're they have great athletes well Bo, Bo we've got one of your books here unbroken <laughs> uh would you say that was the story of today's game for revolver <laughs> i think we got broken a few times but hopefully it'll be the story tomorrow uh we can write unbroken too uh and then that'll be the the story of tomorrow but maybe not either Bo, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Take it easy. <laughs> thanks, Bo. That's Revolver's Bo Kittredge. Very playful, obviously very happy to be moving on to the finals. And uh, that's a Revolver team that has great resolve. And I think he said it well, that nothing against Johnny Bravo, but the Denver team focuses around a few key players, and that hurts when you go against a team like Revolver. You know, we, we talked to Mike Payne at halftime, and you spend some time talking to Mike Payne. He's calm and calculated, and he's created this system with Revolver that makes them so consistently solid. You know, if one or two guys don't have good games, that's fine because they've got 25 other guys that they're confident in to get the job done. So San Francisco gets the win and sets up a championship game matchup with Seattle Sockeye, and that'll come your way tomorrow, the mixed women's and men's finals right here on ESPN3. For Evan Lepler, my cousin saying so long from Frisco ISD Memorial Stadium in Texas, where the final score is San Francisco 14 and Denver 11. To watch this entire game on replay, log on to watchespn.com or download the Watch ESPN app. We thank you for joining us. This has been a presentation of ESPN.